Hello, hello, hello. So this is the last talk. Um, thank you for everyone who's stuck it out. This is uh, one of my favorite conferences every year. This is my fourth time coming to ETHCC. Um, my name is James Beck. I work at Consensus, which you may know MetaMask, Infura, Diligence, Truffle. We essentially build products for helping users and uh, also developers build on Ethereum and increasingly other EVM compatible chains and you know, layer ones like Nier. Um, so I'm director of communications and content. I've been at Consensus for five years. And with that perspective, it's given me a lot of understanding of how narratives around Ethereum, crypto, Web3 have changed over time. And while last year was really exciting, I think we've sort of entered the first era where not only governments, not only people in positions of power, but everyday consumers now have a pretty strong opinion about NFTs, about DAOs, about Web3, and crypto in general. So the title of my talk is that Web3 won't be the money layer of the internet if consumers think it's an earth-destroying scam. I'm using the language of the critics. Um, and so I have four ways to change that narrative. So yeah, ETC 2021, it was really fun. It was the sort of end of DeFi summer, but the beginning of a whole new NFT wave. This is just a basic chart showing uh, Google search interest in NFTs, and you can see it sort of follows the market cycle. In November, you had you know, the highest amount of people researching on Google what is an NFT and trying to understand it, and then it fell off, likely due to people knowing now what an NFT is, but also it kind of followed the market in terms of you know, volume on, on marketplaces like OpenSea. But you also, in 2021, saw record venture capital investment. So there's now 47 Web3 unicorns, which when I first joined at Consensus, that was pretty unthinkable. And 40 of them came out of 2021. And so that's a company with a billion dollar USD valuation. And there were 1,200 deals. The crazy thing is, is that Web3 outpaced biotech as a sector. And look, this is sort of a chart from CB Insights showing where this investment was going. You can see that way too much money entered the United States or was either deal or deals or sourced in the United States. And you also see you know, Asia with way more people but only representing 1.3 billion in deals. And then Europe with about half a billion in total venture capital funding. So with all this money flooding into the space more than the biotech sector, you start obviously getting a lot of mainstream interest. You see all these celebrities becoming apes on, on Twitter and other social media profiles. And you see major outlets like the New York Times trying to understand, OK, if all this is investment in the Web3 sector, what is Web3? We need to explain it to our readers. So Kevin Roos of the New York Times did a What is Web3 explainer. He did an explainer on NFTs, on DAOs. And with that, too, comes general literate uh, opinions on this, on this space. And then, of course, all big brands decided at, at some level of their strategic operations, what is our Web3 plan? What is our Web3 strategy? Some were very overt. I mean, these three examples I have on the screen, uh, Square becomes Block. Facebook, we all remember, became Meta. That was their Metaverse play, but also cribbing some of the ideas from Web3. And then finally, Radio Shack became, I, I don't really know, but uh, this is like a, you know, a Twitter shitposting company that's supposedly doing swaps in DeFi. It doesn't make any sense to me. But anyone, you know, every company had to have a Web3 play. Even companies like you know, Salesforce that do basic CRM, they had to think, OK, what is our Web3 play? However, with any frenzy, you start seeing sentiment turning. So here I picked a few of our favorite crypto critics, if you spend any, you know, too much time on Twitter. You have Stephen Deal. He and su supposed, like, leading technologists uh, ended up drafting a letter to members of the U.S. Congress to essentially say, you need to take action on crypto, not just for the environmental effects of proof-of-work blockchains, but because it represents a scam. That, you know, those are pretty strong fighting words. You have a washed-up, uh, C-list actor, Ben McKenzie from uh, the OC, he's now devoted his entire online persona to teaming up with this guy who's a journalist, Jacob Silverman, and critiquing Web3 projects. And then you have even, you know, really diligent researchers, someone like Molly White, there's a profile on her in the Washington Post, where, you know, she spends a lot of time as a Wikipedia editor and is increasingly um, spending time writing about Web3 topics. 
going even as deep as trying to understand the difference between you know verifiable credentials, um, decentralized IDs, and writing long blog posts on it as a, a critic. And I think some of hers are actually really helpful, and it's important to be open to criticism. But if you've ever spent time trying to edit a, uh, a project page on Wikipedia, you're going to come across all of these folks. Uh, there's this Mr. Gerard is pretty famous for being a person who doesn't let you edit uh, even the Ethereum Wikipedia page because they're so vociferously anti-crypto. If you, you know, if you want to know all the crypto critics that are kind of making their profession out of it in one place, just check out this crypto policy symposium. It's in, I think it's in London or New York. It's later this year. It, these people have literally made their entire online persona and even their career based on being well-known crypto critics. Um, you know, and see, these are some of the people that you see on Twitter. They're the types of people that really are, you know, cautioning to the world of technologists and also regulators that crypto is one giant scam. It doesn't solve any problems. We need to shut it down now. We need to protect consumers. All right. So what does that sort of mean, though, in terms of how do we understand the actual real sentiment of people? I, I brought up a lot of the flashy headlines. I brought up the really loud voices and critique. I even brought up some examples of people who you know, have made their entire living off of being a critic of crypto. Does it really matter? So Water and, Water and Music is um, a pretty interesting research group. They mostly focus on music NFTs. Um, they did this whole report analyzing fan sentiment of music NFT drops. However, they only use Twitter to, uh, to understand data, as well as Meltwater, which, um, if anyone has ever worked in public relations, it's a media sentiment tracking tool. So this is interesting. This is over the course of November 2020 to November 2021. They took pretty much every known uh, music NFT drop, and they ran it through some um, analysis tools using Meltwater to understand was, you know, was sentiment overall positive? Was it overall negative? Um, how does it compare to Twitter sentiment? And what they found is that, you know, there was a huge number of music NFT drops in, you know, the March to May 2021 phase. There were artists like Grimes who were doing NFT drops, largely to fans who had never heard of NFTs. But then there were also artists like Blau, who clearly has a, a large crypto following and was pretty positive about his drops. And so what they found, though, th these are the two of the findings at the end of the report. They found that there was a lot more questions asked than answers. So number one, um, Sherry Hu and the rest of the Water and Music team decided Twitter is actually not an effective platform for artists to address fan concerns around NFTs. So if you remember during this phase, around you know, May to September, you saw all these new projects saying, OK, we're going to do our NFT drop on Polygon. Polygon is proof of stake. Proof of stake is not as uh, impactful to the environment as proof of work Ethereum. You also saw, uh, you know, saw an artist like Charlie XCX saying part of the proceeds of this is going to a charity. It turns out, according to their research, though, it didn't really address any of the fan concerns, whether it's environmental or financial concerns. And as they put it, it's because Twitter is not actually the best platform for nuanced conversation. The other thing they realized, too, is that even if you are using Twitter as a way to push a narrative or challenge a perception that your audience has, it's not actually a way to you know, have your fans recognize that. The most important thing is that you actually work with your community and understand your fans' concerns initially. And it's also very different if you're an established artist who is introducing it. Um, you know, I think I, I really love the pianist from Berlin, uh, Niels Fromm. He was going to do an NFT. His fans hated it. He ended up not doing the NFT drop. So what we're seeing is in 2021, all of a sudden, everyone has an opinion about NFTs. Everyone has an opinion about crypto. And that, those opinions start affecting actual consumer sentiment. So this is a morning consult survey. 83% of people now are aware of crypto. And crypto is this really broad, amorphous term at this point. But only 26% have a positive opinion. And this is also a chart showing like whether or not people think NFTs are a good investment. Ar arguably, I don't think NFTs are solely for investing purposes. but you know, that, that's the state of the question. So even at the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2022, or 2021, and now this year, you have platforms now responding to it with even the language they're choosing to describe what an NFT is. So Royal is now calling NFTs limited digital assets. 
Fan play, or fan, pl fan apply, is calling them digital collectibles, which we've heard before. And Cirque is calling them fan passes. So they're even trying to address the concerns around NFTs and the stigma by renaming what they're doing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to just a, a little aside, because what we're talking about is opinions and sentiment. And ultimately, we're talking about aesthetics. And so here we are in Paris. I couldn't help but drawing a, a parallel to uh, these two famous cafes. Um, so, you know, not too far away from us, about a kilometer is, on Saint-Germain, is, uh, and, and for, forgive my pronunciation, I, my, my French is shit. So there's Les Deux Magots and Café de Flore. And so Les Deux Magots was this famous cafe in the beginning of the 20th century. You had, you know, preeminent thinkers, people like Simone de Beauvoir, um, that would sit there, they would work, they would talk, they would host salons, and increasingly, you know, the upper echelons of French society would say, oh, I just want to be there to be associated with it. These are, you know, really important people, and they started crowding this Les Deux Magots ca cafe just to, you know, be in the presence of these tastemakers who were sort of shaping the world of art and, uh, and politics and women's rights back in the early 20th century. Literally just across the street is this other cafe, Cafe de Flore, and for whatever reason, the popularity of uh, Les Deux Magots got so big that no one wanted to be there anymore, especially the, the uh, Simone de Beauvoir and uh, Sartre. They were just like, okay, all these people are crowding around. So they just went to the other cafe, and then since then, the other cafe has been more popular. Arguably today, both of them are tourist traps. But the point being is that this is a, this is a pretty interesting um, a take on it. And it was written in 1996. But the fashionable only exists in relation to something that is not that way. The relationship between modishness of the floor and the unmodishness of Dumego isn't just possibly arbitrary, it's necessarily arbitrary. If you place any two things side by side, one will become fashionable and the other will not. A world in which everything is fashionable is impossible to imagine because it implies that there would be nothing to provide a contrast. The reason that when you place any two things side by side, one becomes chic and the other does not, is that it's the nature of desire to choose, and choose absolutely. So what does this have to do with what I was referring to earlier? Ultimately, I think Twitter is a bad place for understanding sentiment because it is a platform that prioritizes people's absolute choices or opinions on something, not nuanced uh, conversation. So now here we're getting to the heart of my, uh, oh, going the wrong way. So here we're getting to the heart of my uh, talk, which is uh, why narratives matter. And not, I'm not here to give you like talking points to be able to go tell someone who's your neighbor who's skeptical of crypto. I'm here to give you sort of the framework by which four approaches can be taken. Why do narratives matter? I think we all know that. Anyone who's been in crypto understands how even the crypto narratives in Ethereum have changed. But when people hear a good story once, they remember it for the rest of their lives. You have this painting, and there's a lot of great old Dutch paintings of people just sitting around and talking in cafes because people and storytelling is a way that you, know, you are actually making choices about the world. And as uh, that cafe comparison I made is, you're making aesthetic reasons or aesthetic choices and reasons to believe something or, or even live. So the four that I've outlined, and this is just kind of broad ideas that I think is the bare minimum for what we need to do as a community, is we need to actually better understand the global sentiment. A lot of the earlier stuff, I was, it was very American-centric and even Western European-centric. The actual use of Web3 is global. And so I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. We also need to celebrate the inspiring stories of Web3. We've spent way too much time in this recent downturn talking about all the scammers, and, and it feels like in some ways it's a bodily reaction to all the shit that's been happening that is scammy. And so we, we see 3 Arrows Capital, we see all these c projects like Voyager and Celsius becoming bankrupt, and I think that's actually good. It's almost like an immune system response. However, the, the problem is that people are aligning these stories with all of crypto. It's become a condemnation on our space. Finally, we need to win over the ESG conscious consumers and companies, and we need to inspire with knowledge that sparks action. All right, so how do we better understand global sentiment around Web3? Crypto polling is pretty limited right now. We have Gemini, which in 2020, they did a state of US crypto. This year, they actually expanded it. They did you know, 30,000 adults in 20 countries around the world. 
here are some interesting findings. So one, they see it, you know, crypto as people around the world think of it as a store of value, especially in an era of higher inflation. They think that, you know, diversi diversification of your portfolio is important. Education and regulation, though, are still top barriers. And then in Indonesia and Nigeria, more than half of crypto investors are women. All of this, though, I think is not as important for the Ethereum and Web3 ecosystem because we're not telling people to just buy our token or invest in Ethereum. Ethereum and Web3 is a lot more than a speculative investment. It's a place for commercial activity. It's a place for culture. And so what we're doing now at Consensus is my team, we're working on a global perception survey similar in scale to this Gemini report, which came out after we had already started ours. But we do, you know, we, we survey 22,000 people in 15 countries. Um, it's going to come out probably in September or October after we're done with our data analysis. But the important thing that differentiates it from other polling is that we're actually trying to understand existing concerns of the web, data privacy, banking systems, and also whether or not people understand Web3 terms and if they think it's a solution to those concerns. Here, I'm, I'm just pulling out a bit of data just to show you what, what already is, is giving me some pretty interesting things. So th these are people who answered the question like, do you know what NFTs are? Do you own any? Do you plan on buying any? Vietnam, India, and Indonesia have the highest level of awareness of what NFTs are and the highest percentage of ownership. And then also in Nigeria and South Africa and, and several other Asian countries, you're seeing the highest likelihood for people to be interested in buying an NFT over the next 12 months. Most of the NFT major drops were Yuga Labs, American companies. This is actually a strong indication that the, you know, the next huge wave of crypto adoption is not going to be happening or led by the United States. DAO awareness, similar, similar ideas. So a lot of people in, in France, Germany, the United States are not aware of what DAOs are. Look at Vietnam. Over 50% of the people that responded are aware of what DAOs are. That's phenomenal in my opinion. Because I'm running out of time. I'm going to move a little quicker. Okay, so how do we celebrate the inspiring stories of Web3? You often see this, and this is like, I can't stand this type of post, but this is like a, a classic Bitcoiner post. You take a world event, right now, actually, last night in Henan province in China, uh, there was a sort of run on a bank, and then uh, military tanks moved in to sort of defend the People's Bank of China from people trying to withdraw cash. Classic Bitcoiner response, Bitcoin fixes this. That might be the case, but it's not about what is possible, it's about what's happening now. And so I, I really like to think that we need to be, as a community and you know, the journalists in our space, but also the storytellers, highlighting that Ethereum is this regenerative technology. I think it sounds a bit cliche given that DeFi and ReFi are these new terms and ReFi seems to be a reaction of DeFi and degenerates and regenerates is this new reaction to all of that. And you have you know, people like Kevin Owaki, green pilling people, but I think it's really true. And there's actually, like the Gitcoin grants round 13 had 88 different climate projects. I, I, uh, I gave money to each of those, and I had no idea what uh, three quarters were. I'd never heard of them. Gitcoin Grants is only one venue for knowing about all the creative shit that people are building on Ethereum right now. And look at these examples. Like, there's, uh, you know, there's already been attempts at uh, natural asset-backed stablecoins, but I had never heard of Kumo. Spark Eco, they're doing uh, solar funding in emerging markets. Moon Jelly Dow, never heard of that. Invested in it, or, or really gave them a grant. They're decentralizing global ocean conservation. And so there's all these projects that are actually providing you know, real world good. And it actually is actually starting to have an effect. This was um, an op-ed written by a professor in, in Ireland. And he said, after going to ETH Barcelona, which was two weeks ago, it actually challenged the idea that crypto is, is pretty shilly and scammy. Because it, it seems to him that it felt like a claim that the real purpose of Ethereum is to act as a laboratory for broader political projects and site of economic experimentation. And then, although, you know, everyone, or typically, you know, when you talk about Web3, it's very pro-market, the aim of Web3, according to him, is not exploitation, but regeneration. I even got to meet, uh, another example is I got to meet someone who started Ethic Hub. They've been doing uh, DeFi staking since 2018 before staking and DeFi as a, a sector was even called DeFi. And all the coffee at ETH Barcelona was used or was from the farmers in Mexico and Central America where they've been providing uh, financing through DeFi protocols. This is a fun one. I, I mean, I think it was like at the height of the market insanity, but it's another example where, you know, you have something where people kind of create an internet flash mob, and that's where I see kind of DAOs being pretty effective and also capturing the creativity and interest. 
ultimately it was it was futile and I think it's funny that they were also trying to bid their total amount they're raising in the open and maybe in some cases Ethereum as a transparent technology isn't the greatest thing if you're trying to bid on a private Sotheby's market. But w this takeaway from uh, two writers for FWB, Drew Miller and Kevin Munger, was interesting. Um, the implication of the gesture was profound. Here was a group of people staking a claim for Web3 as a tool that could be used to build a world with new rules by purchasing the rules of the old world. It's represented a supersized version of something the world they created would be extremely good at, mass memified mobilization. And then finally, you know, I. If anyone's heard me talk before at DevCon, I gave a talk at, uh, about SUSUs. These are, I think, in my opinion, the most impactful Web3 projects we haven't seen yet. And the reason why is that all the technology we're building and you know, previous talks of this week are going to be used by people for ca use cases that we don't even really um, imagine. And one example is the existing lending circles that people have already been using to raise money. They need a Web3 version of that because with a SUSU, you essentially put in money into a pool you have to trust however many people are in the pool because each month or each week, however you set it up, they get to take the whole amount. And any SUSU in any immigrant club will tell you a story where someone took all the money, and that really can't happen on chain. Uh, and then finally, you know, proof of stake. It was interesting that Vitalik said, does anyone not want proof of stake? And I guess there was one person that raised their hand. But it's, it's absolutely essential if we're going to win the longer term narratives. You have companies like Salesforce that literally received a letter um, signed by several hundred employees critiquing their NFT plans, even though they were building on Polygon proof of stake because of their very limited understanding of, uh, or really they said, you know, NFTs are a scam and they're destroying the environment. You also have just a couple days ago, New York State is banning crypto mining. It's become a politically divisive issue in the United States where really conservative states like Texas are saying, hey, come here. You know, bring your mining. We don't give a shit. And then you have states like New York saying, no, we're actually going to ban mining. I imagine in continental Europe, that's also going to be a big issue as energy prices are increasing due to the war in Ukraine. So proof of work is not just something we need to get rid of. It's something that actually is going to have political effects. And in this story in the New York Times, it, it was showing that the average consumer of electricity in upstate New York had to pay $70 more per energy bill. So mining is actually having real effects on local economies. And if you're trying to build sentiment around something like cryptocurrency, you're not going to do so if people are having to pay more for their energy bills. Again, from the perception poll we're working on, we did find, though, that the perception of uh, you know, cryptocurrency and its relationship to the environment differs by region. Um, and so we are also going to be working on, uh, you know, I think everyone has been, or if you've ever had to defend proof of stake or talk about proof of stake and how it's going to improve, we've been using the stat 99.95% better. And it's still based on sort of like anecdotal uh, evidence and, and also like at home staking setups. But we are going to be working with um, the Crypto uh, Carbon Ratings Institution to be able to actually come up with sort of credibly neutral statistics to prove to journalists that after proof of stake is implemented, we're going to be reducing carbon output by almost, you know, 99%. And then finally, education is a challenge. We all know that. That there's a lot of great communities in the Web3 space that are working on education. You know, you have 101.xyz, Shifi is an incredible group, Rabbit Hole is fun. But I think that, you know, if you look at all the polling, a lot of people said they weren't involved in crypto because they don't have enough educational resources. So these both come from the Gemini State of Crypto report, and it's similar to the, what we're finding as well. If there were more educational resources, People in Africa say 56% more would participate in, or whether it's buy cryptocurrency or participate in a DAO or um, buy an NFT. And so what we're doing is we're building a new learn site for MetaMask. I think it's long overdue. MetaMask has a number of known UX challenges. And what we're thinking about while building this is what is the type of content that is not going to take you an hour to read? And a lot of times when you give you know, someone new to crypto, you give them long onboarding guides, a lot of people aren't going to take the time to read it. So how can you make it engaging with short form text and a lot of visual um, examples? The tone of voice needs to be accessible. It also needs to define a lot of Web3 vocabulary. And finally, how do you make it so that people are motivated to action? You're not just learning about MetaMask. MetaMask is not an end in itself. MetaMask is supposed to inspire you to do things like buy an NFT or join a DAO 
or vote in a, a governance proposal. And I'm going to leave you with one closing thought. There's a tendency to treat technology as an agency, as an agency that has some essential property rather than a site of struggle where people are fighting both internally and externally to it. So there's nothing that we can do that's going to change the narrative of Ethereum if we are not understanding it as a site for struggle. Everyone is going to have a different perspective of what Ethereum should be and what it should be used for, and I think that's fine. But what we need to know is that there will be consumers, there will be people around the world that do associate Web3 or NFTs as having some essential property. It's a scam. It's environmentally harmful. And I think there's a lot we can do to shift their perceptions, and, and hopefully, you know, from this presentation, you can get some of that. Um, we have a few minutes left. My name is James. Again, you can follow me on Twitter, DM me on Telegram, or, or email me. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs>